So I'll warn you right from the outset, this is not a story with a particularly happy ending, although it does have something of a silver lining. And it's something that's somewhat close to me, at least in the literal geographic sense. It's very close because the crash of Pacific Southwest Airlines Flight 182 happened in San Diego. And I do aviation videos sometimes on this channel. And when I do, they tend to be in one of two categories. They're either about the physics of aviation, because I know about physics, or they're about things that are local to San Diego in aviation, because I know San Diego, and I do have a private pilot's license, but I'm not as much of an expert in aviation as people that have flying as their primary career. But this is something I know a fair bit about, and I don't normally dive into accident reports, but this one is from uh, almost 50 years ago at this point, so it's something that's had quite a bit of time for the dust to settle, although there are still family members of the victims that are still alive at this point. Of course, they're mostly children and grandchildren, but nevertheless, there's people who remember the incident and are still affected by it. So I try my best to be sort of respectful of that. But it's something that is worth talking about and remembering because, well, a significant number of people died. Everybody on the... Pacific Southwest Airways Flight 182 died, several people on the ground died, and both occupants of the Cessna 172 that the Southwest Air Pacific Southwest Airways 727 collided with, both pilots on board that Cessna died. And so this is not something that's particularly fun to talk about, but A, the anniversary is coming up, and B, I do like to think about these accidents for the same reason that most people do, which is we can learn from them, and this is an accident that we learned quite a lot from, and as a result, flying is a fair bit safer today. And, well, it's because this is an incident involving a mid-air collision. And for background, I've done videos about why San Diego's airspace is a little bit unusual, and that was a contributing factor to this accident. There were several causes, and there was a dissenting opinion regarding the causes. But on the day that this occurred, there were good visual meteorological conditions, so clear visibility, no clouds preventing airplanes from seeing each other. And there was Pacific Southwest Airways Flight 182, and another reason that it sort of strikes an emotional core resonance with me is that it's a it was a flight between Sacramento and San Diego, which is a flight that I used to fly regularly as a passenger when I was going to UC Davis. I would fly back and forth between the nearest commercial airport, which was Sacramento and San Diego. So I've flown that route many times. Obviously, Pacific Southwest Airlines no longer existed by the time I was in college, which was 2008 to 2012. But at that time, the route was being flown by a Boeing 727, which made a stop in Los Angeles on the way. And they were almost to San Diego, and they were flying the visual approach, which they were cleared for. So they were coming in from the north, and the controller gave them a visual approach clearance, so then they turned to the east to fly what amounts to a something loosely equivalent to a downwind leg of a traffic pattern, although a visual approach is not the same as a traffic pattern. They were flying eastward, parallel to the runway in the opposite direction, and there was also a Cessna 172 that was doing IFR flight training, and that Cessna had two pilots on board, a flight instructor and a student pilot, and the student pilot was under what they called a hood, so they had a, something blocking the front of their vision so that they couldn't see up and out. And so that's to simulate instrument conditions, So because you know, when it's sort of like a visor, and when you're wearing it, you can see sort of down and in front of you, so you can still see the instrument panel, but you can't, uh, unless you cheat and tip your head up, you can't look outside the windows. And so it's used to sort of train pilots on flying on instruments when they're are not actual instrument conditions. 
and the flight instructor was acting as both an instructor and a safety pilot, so the instructor was both telling the student pilot how to operate under instruments, and also because there were visual conditions outside, they were operating under visual separation. So the student pilot was learning to fly IFR, instrument flight rules, but the flight itself was not an IFR flight. They were operating VFR with the instructor pilot acting as the safety pilot, so looking out the windows when the student pilot was wearing the hood so that they could maintain visual separation. And so what happened was the 727 was coming in to fly in a visual approach for runway 27, and they were actually flying away from the airport. And, well, the Lindbergh Tower, now San Diego Tower, because they, for, I think, good reason, actually, decided to just make it San Diego International. But at that time, it would be called Lindbergh Tower, so that's what it says in the NTSB report. But the San Diego Approach Controller told them they were clear for a visual approach and then told them to maintain visual separation with the Cessna because they could see both the PSA 182-727 and the Cessna 172 on their radar because they both had transponders. And they would both show up on primary radar, even if they didn't. And the controller could have provided separation via giving them altitude or heading directions, but instead they just told them to maintain visual separation, which, for the procedures of the time, was perfectly legit. They were, you know, well above board to do that, according to operating rules when this happened. And... The PSA Flight 182 crew said they had the Cessna in sight, which at one point they did. And they were flying much faster than the Cessna because, of course, uh, Boeing 727 has an approach speed that's, you know, on the order of 150 knots, and they would have been flying even faster than that when they were sort of flying away from the airport on something like a downwind. So they were going to take overtake the Cessna, and they needed to maintain that visual separation. And this is where there's some disagreement in the final report about the cause, but everybody agrees on what happened because we have the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorders, and we have the saved data recorder from the radar at the San Diego airport. And what happened was the PSA Flight 182 had the Cessna in sight. They were flying on a heading and a descent rate that they thought would keep them clear and then they lost sight of the Cessna. And at that point, the correct thing to do would have been to immediately notify the controller that they had lost sight of the Cessna and ask them if they were clear of the Cessna or not. And this is where there's some disagreement. Some people in the report said that it was fu fundamentally the responsibility of the PSA 182 crew to report that they lost sight. And it, that was something they should have done. And there is a dissenting opinion as well as a subsequent revision that said a major contributing factor was that it was considered acceptable to give visual separation instructions to two aircraft with such wildly different speeds inside of such a congested airspace. And of course, at the end of the day, the tower controller was doing something that was, or the approach controller, and for that matter, the tower controller, were doing things that were perfectly acceptable. And the PSA Flight 182 crews were doing things that were in violation of procedures, but were sort of perfectly ordinary human mistakes, because I should make a distinction here. There's people will frequently say that the cause of something is pilot error, and it frequently is, but it should be noted that error is not the same as negligence. Right, there's plenty of things where somebody makes a mistake, but it's a mistake that, although if they were acting ideally, they would have done something different, it's a mistake that is within the bounds of ordinary human lapses in judgment, and is not the result of some egregious deviation from procedure as a result of arrogance or laziness or both. Because negligence does happen, but most of the time pilot error is not negligence, it's people making a simple mistake that compounds to have, you know, disastrous and sometimes deadly consequences like it did here. And they should have told the tower controller that they lost sight, but they didn't. And, 
or sorry, they should have told the approach controller they lost sight, but they didn't. And the approach controller should have been seeing that they were converging on one another and issued an instruction, even though he'd told them to maintain visual separation, but he didn't. And, of course, the crew of PSA-182 made one last mistake, which is that instead of thinking that they lost sight because of what actually happened, which is that the Cessna was below where they could see it, right? They were descending, but they were descending in a nose high, relatively nose-high attitude, right? And the Cessna was below them, and the Cessna has relatively bad visibility above itself, right? Because the Cessna is a high-wing airplane, and it's hard to see up above except in front of you. And the, so you have a Cessna that can't really see above and behind itself, and a Evan 27 that can't really see in front and below itself, and they converged on one, each, one another's blind spots. And there were several points where it could have been avoided, but it wasn't, and the 727 collided with the Cessna 172. The Cessna 172 was just immediately obliterated, and both occupants were killed instantly, mercifully. But of course, the passengers and crew of the 727 then had catastrophic damage to the right wing, uh, after which the aircraft quickly became uncontrollable and continued to increase its bank angle to the right and its nose attitude continued to pitch down further and further until it collided with an area in a neighborhood here called North Park, which I used to live in Hillcrest, or technically Mission Hills, which are three sort of adjacent neighborhoods in the sort of, you know, near downtown San Diego. And so I've been to that crash site and you wouldn't know it today. It's just a, another neighborhood of North Park. It's a nice, quiet little area. But of course, the results there that day were just catastrophic. The 727 careened into the ground and even killed several people on the ground. And everybody on the aircraft was killed on impact, essentially. It was just, you know, it was pointing you know, steeply nose down when it hit the ground and traveling with tremendous speed, and it was completely unsurvivable. And some of the debris from the Cessna also rained down in an adjacent neighbor area, or well, an adjacent area in the same neighborhood. And so, well, there were just no survivors, and there were even casualties on the ground. I don't believe the debris from the Cessna caused any casualties on the ground. The a 727 obviously is a much larger, heavier aircraft, and it hit the ground intact for the most part, although at an unsurvivable speed. And so several people were killed on the ground as a result of that. And, well, it's obviously quite tragic. There is a small memorial plaque at the nearby library, and another memorial at the Air and Space Museum here. And there's been several efforts to get a sort of better memorial in the spot near the primary crash site. Uh, hopefully that happens at some point in the future because there are still some living relatives that are, you know, able to remember the, the crash and it would be nice for those families and friends and people affected by it to have a somewhat better memorial because the memorial that exists now, is it's nice and I, you know, am glad that it's there and there's a tree planted by the library. Uh, but there's not very many names on that plaque, and there are some issues with the plaque in the Air and Space Museum where some of the names aren't quite correct, and lots of people would like to have a memorial that's actually closer to the crash site. Well, it would be nice if that would happen. But I said at the beginning, there is a silver lining, and it's true, because as a result of this incident, although initially the primary blame was placed on the PSA flight crew for not calling out that they had lost sight of the Cessna, and that was, if you had to pick a single cause, that would be it. But there was also significant issues with the way that separation services were provided, and there have been several changes made, one of which is something called TCAS, or Traffic Collision Avoidance System. And TCAS is a system that directly prevents air-to-air -air collisions by telling the occupants of a TCAS equipped aircraft if they're approaching another aircraft which has a transponder. So it doesn't just tell the flight crew that they're approaching another aircraft with TCAS, it tells the flight crew anytime they're on a collision course with an aircraft that is also equipped with a transponder, because the way TCAS works is it basically is a small radar 
on the TCAS aircraft, and it sends out pings to find out if there's any aircraft in the sort of vicinity that might be on a collision course. And if it detects any possible collision course, which, you know, there is always a probability because for a collision to happen, aircraft have to meet at a point in time and in space. But with enough traffic volume, it is always possible that they will. And so a TCAS will never issue a heading change. It will always issue an altitude change because if you change the headings, you can still have headings that will converge and it'll just adjust the timing and it might prevent a collision, but it's not guaranteed to. But what it will do is it will just issue a climb instruction to the aircraft at a higher altitude and a descend instruction to the aircraft at a lower altitude. Or if they're at the same altitude, it will issue a climb instruction to one and a descend instruction to the other based on their respective headings. Because aircraft on identical headings will never be on a collision course because they'll be just be flying parallel. And so if they're off, they have to be off by at least a fraction of a degree to be on a collision course. And so based on who's on the westerly and who's on the easterly heading, it will issue climb or descend instructions to prevent the collision. And so this incident is not the only reason that TCAS was implemented, and there had been studies on a TCAS system for quite some time. But this incident was one of the things that really made the final push to make TCAS get implemented and go from just a concept they were thinking about requiring to something they decided was really necessary. And they also made changes to the way that air traffic control operates and made it so that visual separation was still an option. And indeed, visual approaches and visual separation are still used to this day, but the conditions are much more stringent and they would never they would never issue a visual separation instruction under conditions like that today for a bunch of reasons, including but not limited to the ones that I've mentioned, which is, you know, aircraft with such hugely different speeds like that should not be issued visual separation instructions because the 727 is just traveling too fast relative to the Cessna and it has too many blind spots that visual separation really wasn't feasible under those conditions. And the flight crew should have notified ATC as soon as they lost visual separation, but given everything, the loss of visual separation was essentially inevitable. They just should have made ATC aware as soon as it happened, instead of assuming that it was because they had overtaken the Cessna. And so, well, today, pretty much all, well, all commercial airliners in the United States are required to have TCAS, including any airliners operating inside the United States, not just ones registered in the United States. And so flying is quite a bit safer as a result, because if there's about to be a mid-air collision, TCAS will immediately notify both flight crews, and TCAS is not foolproof either. There can still be mid-air collisions, and there have been mid-air collisions, but there have not been any major mid-air collisions in the United States since, and TCAS is one of the many reasons for that. So, anyways, I don't usually talk about accidents like this, but I thought it was relevant, so... I thought I'd do a brief synopsis and, uh, I don't know, hopefully that sort of improved memorial gets built in North Park someday. Um, this isn't really a very big channel, but I guess if you're watching to the end here uh, and you happen to also live here, uh, you know, make it known to the San Diego City Council that you would also like that memorial built. Uh, I actually am in North County, so I, you know, can make my opinion known to the city council even if I can't strictly speaking vote in the uh, San Diego city council elections because I vote in the Encinitas city council elections that's where I live but yeah um, thanks for watching I guess be glad that flying is safer today as a result of the unfortunate tragedy back in 1978 uh, yeah not a happy subject but well like I said, there's a silver lining, and hopefully the better memorial gets built someday, so. Bye.